Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. Currently, I'm a member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. I'm a district activist leader for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. I want to thank all of you who are joining us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to connect you with MS experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. So as I chat with our expert today, please feel free to post your questions on Facebook and YouTube, or type them into the question box if you're joining us on GoToWebinar. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's program. Research has shown that in addition to being essential to general health and well-being, exercise and lifestyle physical activity are helpful in managing many MS symptoms. Today, we're talking with Dr. Nora Fritz, and Dr. Fritz will be sharing some expert insights on the impact lifestyle physical activity and exercise have on MS and what you can do to make exercise and physical activity a part of your everyday routine. Dr. Fritz is a board certified neurologic physical therapist and an assistant professor in the physical therapy program, the Department of Healthcare Sciences and Department of Neurology at Wayne State University School of Medicine, where she's also the director of the Neuroimaging and Neurorehabilitation Laboratory. Dr. Fritz's research interests include examining the influence of cognition on mobility and exploring exercise interventions to improve function in people with neurologic conditions. She's particularly interested in linking clinically observable function to structural imaging and predicting the outcomes of exercise interventions using neuroimaging. Her laboratory is currently funded by the National Multiple Sclerosis Society and the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Fritz. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Lifestyle, physical activity, and exercise have been shown to benefit people with MS, but some studies suggest that people living with MS are less active than people in the general population. So to provide the MS community with fact-based guidance for promoting exercise and lifestyle, physical activity, the MS Society recently convened a group of experts to develop exercise and lifestyle physical activity recommendations for all people with MS, regardless of their ability level. Dr. Fritz, maybe we can get into these recommendations by having you explain the definition and the difference between lifestyle physical activity and exercise. Absolutely. So when we think about lifestyle physical activity, we're thinking about these kinds of activities that are either planned or unplanned in our day but tend to incorporate things that we do for leisure, our occupation or our job, or any kind of household activities, including chores, that are at least of moderate to vigorous intensity. On the other hand, exercise is more of a planned leisure activity. Um, it's usually performed repeatedly over an extended period of time, like you would see in exercise training. And it has a specific external objective. So usually this objective is to improve fitness, or to improve functional performance, or even just to improve overall health and wellness. But I do want to point out one thing that's pretty important is that these two things, physical activity and exercise, are distinct and different from rehabilitation. And rehabilitation we would really define as more of an intermittent or even ongoing use of interdisciplinary activity to regain optimal physical function and promote functional independence. Um, and, and often the goal of rehab is to improve overall quality of life as well. So we have these kind of three distinct areas that we can look at when we're talking about physical activity. 
You know, a moment ago, I mentioned that these new guidelines that the MS Society released, they indicate that exercise and physical activity are beneficial and safe for all people living with MS, regardless of their ability level. So Dr. Fritz, what are some of the benefits people with MS experience when they incorporate physical activity and exercise into their daily routine? That's a great question. Exercise has this really wide reaching benefit for all individuals, regardless of whether they have MS or not, but in particular for individuals with MS. There's been some initial studies within the MS population looking at exercise as symptomatic treatment. So for um, the improvement of things like balance and range of motion, muscle strength and power, um, arm and hand function, for decreasing leg spasms, increasing functional capacity, which is just your endurance or your ability to exercise, and even for better respiratory function. So we have nice evidence to support all of those different benefits of exercise. We also have some nice evidence to support symptomatic management of things like fatigue, quality of life, cognition, um, ability to participate in daily activities, decreased pain, improvements in depression, improvements in disability level, and even better bladder control and better cardiovascular health. So there's that line of research looking at the symptomatic management, but there's also some really nice evidence to support uh, disease modifying effects of exercise. So um, similar to a disease modifying therapy, there's some evidence to support, especially from animal models, that exercise can slow the progression of MS. Um, and so that's something that we're really excited and interested in looking at further. And it supports this idea of medicine in MS, uh, um, exercise as medicine. You know, as you were mentioning some of the symptom management benefits, it made me think that there are other chronic illnesses like diabetes and hypertension that can actually exacerbate MS. And I'm wondering, does exercise could it also have an impact on these other conditions? Of course. Um, so just, just like in a regular population of, of individuals who do not have MS, um, there's amazing cardiovascular benefits of exercise. And this is regardless of the underlying pathology. So improving our cardiovascular health and strength positively impacts blood pressure. Um, that is to say it lowers blood pressure and studies have shown that in increased exercise can also help, of course, with weight loss, but with management of type 2 diabetes. And I think one of the most exciting things about exercise is that there's no adverse side effects like you might see with taking a medication. Um, and also it's something that the client or the individual has complete control over. So in a disease course that can sometimes seem a little bit unpredictable, uh, exercise is something that you can control. And I think that's pretty important. You know, we know that changes in cognitive function, depression, and other mood changes are common in people with MS. And I heard you touch on this a moment ago. I think it's, it's worth kind of reinforcing um, whether exercise or lifestyle physical activity have an impact on cognitive functions and mood change in people with MS. Yeah, there's been some evidence to support this um, improvements in cognition, specifically following exercise training. There, I, to my knowledge, there hasn't been necessarily one particular type of exercise that is the most effective at um, initiating these cognitive changes or changes in mood or depression. Um, but in general, the type of exercise that is typically used is aerobic exercise. So thinking about those exercises that make you out of breath um, when you do them. So brisk walking or cycling, um, those sorts of activities, swimming. Um, and then we often see these other dual task exercises. So this is just a fancy term that means you're doing two things at once and it's typically um, a cognitive task and then a motor task. So maybe that's walking while doing some other cognitive or challenging task at the same time. So those are typically what's seen in the research studies that show changes in cognitive function after exercise. You know, talking about exercise, in order to really gain the benefit of exercise, it really needs to become a regular part of someone's everyday routine. Dr. Fritz, what should the goals of exercise or lifestyle, physical activity, what should those goals be for someone who's living with MS? Yeah, great question. Um, I saw this nice quote from the director of the NIH that said, 
if exercise was a pill, it would be the most widely prescribed medication in the United States or in the world. And I think that that's, that's pretty true. So if it was easy, everyone would do it. Um, and sometimes that's the hardest part is just getting started with exercise. So really, I think that learning how what your baseline level is and then setting realistic goals is the best way to make exercise um, a part of your lifestyle. So you want to look at where you are right now. Are you already an exerciser or are you not really? You just go through your day and you, you're not uh, purposefully doing any exercise. So what I typically do is advise my clients to go pretty slowly and set reasonable goals. So one way to do that is to use like a pedometer or a step counter on your Fitbit or your watch or your phone to see how much you're moving on a regular day, which just your baseline level look like. And then you can set goals to increase the number of steps or the number of minutes of exercise based on this. So if I gave you an example, I might say that, you know, let's say you're doing 2000 steps on a regular day, but your goal is 10,000 steps a day. It's not fairly re realistic to go from 2000 to 10,000 overnight. Um, just like if you were running one mile regularly, you wouldn't expect to run a marathon the next day. Um, Training is important. We don't want to have injuries or overuse issues. Um, so we want to go slowly and set realistic goals. So you might say to yourself, okay, what if I try to increase the number of steps that I take each week by 10%? Um, so that would look like, you know, 2,200 steps per day instead of 2,000. And I think that's a more realistic goal than going from 2,000 to 10,000. Um, and you try to sustain that for about a week or longer. And that becomes your new baseline before you set your next goal to increase your number of steps again. And you can do the same thing with the number of minutes of exercise. So if you're currently exercising for 10 minutes, but your goal is to increase your time and your intensity of your exercise, you might wanna work on your endurance first. So can you exercise for longer than 10 minutes before you start to increase the intensity? Um, and really keeping track of, of your symptoms and how you're feeling after you make these increases in your exercise or your steps. Um, so your goal setting needs to include both endurance and intensity. So you can bike for 10 minutes and you could do that by gently pedaling or you could do it by vigorously sprinting all out on the bike and it would still be 10 minutes of exercise either way. Um, so you wanna think about you know, both the endurance piece and the intensity piece. So we see how you can track how much exercise you're doing, both in time and intensity. How can someone know if they're doing too much exercise or maybe not doing enough? Sure. So I think you always have to listen to your body. Uh, you know yourself best. And if you're doing too much exercise, you might find that you're unable to complete other activities during your day or that you might have some increase in your symptoms. But this is why I recommend logging your activity and your symptoms at your baseline before you change anything at all um, for a few days, because that way you'll know what your normal fluctuations are before you start an exercise program or increase your current level of exercise. Um, on the flip side, though, we also know that a sedentary lifestyle in any person, not just those with MS, is associated with fatigue and poor sleep. So if you're already experiencing quite a lot of fatigue and you exercise and you still feel fatigued, that might just be a, the effect of deconditioning. So if you haven't been exercising quite a lot, you might just feel tired because you added exercise, but over time, the exercise could actually make you feel more energized. So I think that's important to think about. And then as far as like sticking with that exercise plan or tracking it, there's some great tools for doing that. Um, you can use apps on your phone or your Apple Watch if you have that or your Fitbit to log things. But you can also just use a good old paper diary uh, where you track your exercises on paper and how many minutes did you do and your symptoms like rating how effortful something was or how fatigued you felt afterward or if you had any pain, those sorts of things. Um, I always advise for sticking with your program to choose activities that you actually like doing. Um, so if you don't like cycling, that maybe isn't the best one for you to pick because um, you won't want to stick with it if you don't really like it. And you also want to think about finding a partner or someone who can exercise with you. Uh, I realize that's a little bit challenging in the time of COVID, but if you have someone in your home who might also want to exercise with you, that will 
you'll be more likely to stick with an exercise program if there's someone else doing it with you. You know, circling back to the MS Society's recently released exercise recommendations, um, the recommendations were tailored by disability level using the EDSS, which is something many people with MS are a little bit familiar with. What can you tell us about the EDSS scale? What's that all about? Sure, this stands for the Expanded Disability Status Scale. Um, I'm sure many of you have experienced this before with the neurologist's office where you're, you get an eye exam, they look at strength, you do a short walk. Um, it's basically looking at all the different systems that could be involved by uh, multiple sclerosis and then setting a score. Um, the most neurologists use this EDSS to rate disability in MS, and it's commonly used in MS clinical trials as well. It's a zero to 10 scale where zero is no disability and 10 is death from MS. And it's not an interval scale. So I think this is really important to point out. So the difference between a zero and a one is not the same as the difference between a six and a seven on this particular scale. So that's really important when you look at things like exercise trials in MS that compare EDSS pre to post. Um, so generally, when we look at the EDSS, a score from zero to four and a half would indicate mild impairment in function. Five to six and a half would indicate impairments in walking distance, and maybe you use a mobility aid like a walker or a cane, and you might have difficulty with transferring from the floor or in and out of chairs. And then the EDSS of seven to nine would represent significant impairments in walking usually limiting walking to about 10 feet with a walker and even up to up to a nine, you could be potentially confined to a chair or a wheelchair and require lots of assistance with transfers and sitting and standing balance. So in crafting these new recommendations, the expert panel um, indicated that wherever someone might fall on this EDSS scale, People with MS can still safely participate in some form of exercise or lifestyle physical activity. Dr. Fritz, can you share some exercise modalities that you might recommend to someone with MS based on different disability levels? Sure, I definitely can. I just want to start by saying that I am always in support of, of people seeing and meeting with a rehab professional and talking with their doctor before they start a, an exercise program to make sure that they're safe to do so. Um, it's always a good idea to make sure that you're doing it safely and not, not looking to cause any additional injury. Um, a therapist can make sure that you stay safe while you do your exercise program, challenge you with uh, different exercises and, and set a wellness program for you that you can check back in with them and have them advance over time. So that's just kind of my, my disclaimer before we get into this. Um, so I'll kind of go through the different um, EDSS levels and talk a little bit about um, different exercises that an individual who has either mild impairment, walking, limited walking, uses a wheelchair or confined to a better chair might do to meet those exercise uh, guidelines. Um, so regardless of your disability level, I think you want to consider four different types of exercise. There's aerobic exercise that we mentioned earlier, which is something that gets your heart rate up, makes you breathless. Resistance exercise, that's the strength training that makes your muscles stronger. Flexibility or stretching, which helps keep your muscles elongated and loose. And then neuromotor or balance exercises, which challenge your balance and your coordination. So within, regardless of your disability level, you want to think about targeting these four different areas. So the, the guidelines really recommend different exercises to meet all of those needs. So if we're thinking within the aerobic category, this is where we get out of breath and, and really work out sort of intensively. Um, if you have mild impairment, you could consider things like walking, cycling, rowing, jogging or running, if that's something you've already been doing. Um, aquatic exercise, so either swimming or water aerobics, upright stepping like on an elliptical or a stepper. And you can add uphill terrains outdoors to make it more challenging. Um, if you're a limited walker though, you might wanna consider something like um, cycling on a stationary bike or arm ergometry. 
um, which is one of those uh, R machines where you kind of cycle it. And you could even do rowing if your balance allows for that. If you're a wheelchair user, arm ergometry is a great way to get your heart rate up. And you could also do um, functional electrical stimulation cycling or FES cycling if that's available to you. Um, this is where electrodes are attached to muscles in the legs to help with movements during cycling. And then if you are more confined to a bed or a chair, um, you can still participate in arm ergometry or if that's too challenging, um, using a spirometer, which would allow you to um, expand your lungs and still uh, provide some uh, input for the lungs to prevent pneumonia. So that's an important thing to do. So working on those breathing exercises. So that kind of encompasses the aerobic piece. Um, if we think about resistance, this is strengthening. If you have mild impairment, uh, you could do weight training at the gym or at home using free weight machines, resistance bands, or just body weight exercises. And you want to be sure that you're targeting your legs, your arms, and your core, which includes both the front and the back. Um, so all of your major muscle groups. If you're a limited walker or a wheelchair user, kind of the same thing as the individuals who are of mild impairment, but you just be adjusting those exercises to be in sitting rather than in standing and practicing um, sit to stand transfers. So from a chair to standing um, in more functional movements like bed mobility. And if you're confined to a bed or a chair, you can use resistance bands or even active range of motion that could be sufficiently challenging. Um, and you'll also wanna practice bed mobility or bed to toilet transfers or bed to chair transfers to increase the strength in your legs. If we look at flexibility then, um, across all levels of disability, we want to think about daily stretching of key muscles. Um, I like to include the gastrocs, which are our calves, our hamstrings, our quads, the hip flexors, especially if we spend a lot of time sitting, we want to make sure that we can stretch out those muscles in the front of our hips. Um, the hip adductors, which are the muscles on the inside of our thighs, our pecs. Um, so if we spend a lot of time sitting and we find that we're slumped forward, we want to make sure that we're stretching out and opening up the chest, um, stretching out our neck muscles, getting good posture. So really targeting all of these major muscle groups. So again, this is a nice time for a rehab professional to give their expert opinion on what needs to be targeted as far as stretching and strengthening. And then our last category is the neuromotor or the balance. Sorry, John, I'm, I could go on about this forever. So um, feel free. <laughs> this is the category that we're looking to target uh, fall prevention. So our goal here is really postural stability, coordination, and agility. Um, so if you have mild impairment or you're a limited walker, you'll want to think about things like yoga, Pilates, dance, Tai Chi, um, virtual reality, if that's available to you, hippotherapy, which is therapy on a horse, if you have that available to you, um, challenging balance training, like standing on one foot or standing on uneven surfaces, um, these kinds of really challenging balance activities. If you're a wheelchair user or confined to a chair, you could consider a chair yoga, um, Tai Chi, and if you're able to stand at all, incorporating standing balance, so just a standing program where you're up out of the chair, for extended periods of time, that can be quite helpful. Um, and also sitting balance by sitting without your back supported. Um, so sitting forward on your chair and trying to make sure that your trunk is doing the work um, with nice, good posture. And then the last one, if you're confined to a bed, I would just recommend um, working on your balance by sitting up in bed with your back unsupported if you're able to do that even for short periods of time. I'm curious, one of the exercise recommendations in terms of time and intensity of the exercise itself? So the guidelines recommend 150 minutes a week of exercise, um, but that's not going to be feasible for every person. So if we look in the EDSS of let's say zero to 6.5, so those would be those individuals who are still ambulatory or walking, they would wanna target aerobic exercise at two to three times a week, um, 10 to 30 minutes of moderate exercise. Now, you'll notice if you calculate that, that doesn't equal 150 minutes. So um, you're going to start there and work your way up. Hopefully, that would be the goal. But we're looking at moderate intensity exercise, which we would 
say would be 40 to 60% of your heart rate max. And if you want to calculate your heart rate max, it's 220 minus your age um, is how you calculate that. And if you were previously exercising, you might actually advance right up to five times a week of aerobic exercise for 40 minutes, up to 40 minutes. Um, at 70 to 80% of your heart rate max, which would be a more vigorous kind of exercise. So we're always looking for that moderate to vigorous exercise in the aerobic range. For resistance training in this uh, group of people who are ambulatory or walking, we're thinking about um, two to three times a week for those exercises and flexibility daily, and then the balance exercises three to six times a week. So it's a pretty, uh, intensive schedule to kind of keep up with these guidelines. And then the people who are in the later category, so EDSS of seven to eight and a half, um, <clears throat> it's similar recommendations, but they also recommend incorporating breathing exercises here. Um, so that I mentioned this spirometer earlier, um, and they, that's definitely recommended for resisted breathing exercises um, up to every other day is what the recommendation includes. We've heard from Amber, who was recently diagnosed with MS, and she says she's never exercised in her life. We also heard from Thomas, who was diagnosed last year, and Thomas is a marathon runner. So what sort of recommendations uh, can you share with us on how people can adjust their level of exercise when they are newly diagnosed with MS? So when we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the, I think a key message is that exercise is beneficial even if you have to do it differently than how you did it before. Um, so I often talk to clients who were avid exercisers like Thomas before their diagnosis about defining a new baseline. And this is a really, really challenging thing to do. Um, so you can't expect to go out and exercise as hard or as long as you did before but you still need to be able to set challenging goals for yourself. So it's really about adjusting your expectations, um, which is much easier said than done. Um, so an, an incremental goal setting that we talked about earlier is a nice way to approach this. Um, so, so look at your new baseline and start from there to work towards your goal. So I would give that same advice to Amber or to Thomas. What's your current baseline and where do you want to be? And let's set realistic goals to get there. Um, but I think the biggest takeaway is really to just get started with exercise if you've never done it before or to keep exercising um, and find activities that you like and people who you like to do them with to help you stay uh, honest and, and keep, keep doing it. Well, thank you, Dr. Fritz. Before we continue our discussion, I want to welcome those of you who have continued to join us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. Please let us know what's on your mind. Post your comments and questions on Facebook and YouTube, or type them into the question box if you've joined us on GoToWebinar. Our Ask an MS Expert live event takes place at this same time every Friday. So please help us make sure that everyone knows about it by sharing news about the webcast with your family, your friends, and all your social media connections. I mentioned this earlier, and I think it's worth circling back to because we know that for people living with MS and for people who aren't living with MS, frankly, incorporating exercise into our daily lives can be challenging. Dr. Fritz, what are some of the most common barriers and facilitators people with MS face that might influence their decision to engage in lifestyle, physical activity, or exercise? It's a great question. So within this guidelines document, they list quite a few barriers and facilitators that have been brought forward. Some of the most common barriers are things like not having a place to go to work out or being far from a major medical center, um, maybe having limited support financially or um, from their, their support system or their family to engage in exercise. Maybe it's related to their health, so having a lot of fatigue, um, lots of fluctuation in symptoms, other comorbidities, or even um, time, not having enough time to, to engage in these exercises between work and childcare and all these other things. But then this is weighed with some of the facilitators, which might include um, actually having the, the resources to do these exercises and having people who support you. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting when I read through these barriers and facilitators from the guidelines is that um, 
they they agree pretty strongly with a focus group that we a study we just did in my lab of people who were newly diagnosed with MS. And we wanted to understand what information they were given about exercise at diagnosis. And the answers were kind of all over the board. So some people had no guidance at all as far as exercise was concerned um, after they were diagnosed. Others were given uh, some information, but very little. And so a lot of people had questions like, will I exacerbate my symptoms if I start exercising? How intensively should I exercise? How do I access exercise and rehabilitation resources? So all these barriers and questions. Um, and so I think one of the, the biggest things that I would wanna reiterate again is that if you haven't met with a rehab specialist like a physical therapist, I highly encourage you to do so. They can answer any of these questions that you have. Um, and also help you set up a wellness program that you can maintain with what barriers and facilitators you have personally in your own life. Um, so that that would be my advice for that. Of course, I'm a little biased because I'm a physical therapist as well, and I want you to come see me. So, Well, let's drill down into how some of those MS symptoms might pose some of those barriers you just described and how people might be able to work around them. For instance, fatigue very common symptom in MS. What are some strategies for handling fatigue during exercise? Sure. So other than fatigue, I think the most common um, challenge that I see in, in clients with MS is the recurrence of old symptoms. And so I want to make sure to mention that because I think it can be really scary if that happens to you and you're when you're exercising, especially when you first start a new program. So um, as you're exercising, you will experience a rise in your core body temperature, and this can cause previously damaged nerves to kind of short circuit. Uh, and that will lead the individual to feel old symptoms or an increase in symptoms. But thankfully, there's an easy solution to this problem if you know and or expect it to happen. And that is to stay cool. So exercising in a cold environment and drinking lots of ice water can help to minimize this effect. Um, and if it happens to you, just stop and take a break. Once your body cools back down, the symptoms should resolve. And there's also cooling vests or cooling garments that can help to minimize this um, as you're exercising. So I just wanna mention that because certainly fatigue can be one of those symptoms that can pop up its head while you're exercising. Um, so although it seems a little bit contradictory, exercise can actually help to improve MS fatigue. Um, and I always have to, I always have to um, you know, argue with people about this because they're like, no, I'm too tired to exercise. And I'm like, but if you do, it will help. Um, they're like, no, it will make me more tired. And I'll say, no, it will not help. <laughs> so we have to have this conversation. Um, when you first start exercising, you might feel a little bit fatigued, but that's really usually due to overcoming deconditioning, just like anybody who starts a brand new exercise program. Um, but studies from Others, including our lab, have shown that combining aerobic, which was that exercise that makes you breathless, and resistance, the strength training, can actually help to reduce MS fatigue. So that's really exciting. Um, over time, these exercises can help you make, make you feel more energized and help reduce your overall fatigue. Um, so of course, the strategy for managing fatigue is always to start slow, set realistic goals, and work your way up slowly. So if you're exercising and you experience fatigue, stop, take a break assess how you feel and see if you can continue. I know when you're living with MS and you experience an exacerbation, it, it interrupts a lot of areas of your life. And I can imagine that an exacerbation is going to impact someone's ability to stay active and keep up with their exercise routine. Um, what are some recommendations for someone who perhaps recently had a relapse and it interrupted their exercise routine and they wanna get back to it. Um, how do they get back to it? How do they safely incorporate modifications into that routine? Absolutely, great question. Um, once again, I recommend seeing a physical therapist after a relapse. They can help you modify your activities specific to you so that you can get back safely. Um, but remember our goal setting that we've been talking about. So after a relapse, you have a new baseline. So let's reestablish what is our baseline and start our realistic goal setting from there so that you can work your way up. Um, then the National MS Society has some nice resources on their website about modification of exercise. So that's a nice place to start. Um, but your rehab professionals are really your source for 
uh, specific individualized recommendations for making exercise safe for you. You know, there are some people who prefer exercising at home. Uh, others prefer going to a gym. And some folks like outdoor activities, and others prefer staying indoors. So what should people with MS consider when they're deciding where to exercise? Sure. Um, consider the weather. So we want to try to avoid exercising outdoors in the hottest part of the day during the summer months. Um, which is usually between like 10 and 2 o'clock um, and opt for cooler environments instead. So maybe those with air conditioning in the summer. In the winter months, we want to be aware of ice and snow outside. So before the call, I was just telling John and that I had been outside taking a walk and it was quite icy and snowy. So you want to be aware of that wherever you're living. So that might impact your decision on whether to exercise indoors versus out of doors. Um, whether to exercise at a gym or at home is um, can be largely driven by whether your gym is open right now or not, of course, but also we want to think about that the gym might have some equipment that you don't have at home um, and it could provide more of a challenge for you. So, for example, you might opt to do your aerobic training and your resistance training at the gym uh, so that you can use a treadmill or a bike or weight machines but then stay at home for your flexibility and your neuromotor exercises um, where you can follow a YouTube video or an exercise DVD or your own home wellness program. You know, while we're in the midst of a global pandemic and we're trying to observe safe social distancing, I'm wondering if you have some tips that you can share on how to stay active, but still say, stay safe. Sure. Um, we're all we're all adjusting to this pandemic still, I think. Um, but I, I would encourage you to take advantage of the society's excellent resources. I particularly like the free from falls um, webinar and the building better balance videos. Those are nice ones that you can do at home. Um, there's also many excellent YouTube resources for things like chair yoga or Tai Chi or standing balance exercises that could be helpful for your neuromotor piece. Um, I would always recommend to get outside and walk as much as you're able to safely. Um, of course, looking at the weather and making sure that, you know, you're, there's no ice, those sorts of things. If you do have stairs in your home and you're safe to do so, you can practice stair climbing as a form of aerobic exercise or even just step ups, one step and back down. Um, and I often recommend, like the exercise that I recommend most frequently to people that I see in the clinic is a sit to stand. So just practicing getting in and out of a chair, up and down. Um, it's a really good strength exercise for your legs. If you do them, a lot of them repeatedly, it can be an aerobic exercise that gets your heart rate up and moving. Um, and it's a great way to strengthen muscles of your legs that we use for standing and walking. Um, I think the real goal is just to try to stay as active and moving as possible. You can always use body weight exercises for resistance training if you're not able to get to a gym and you don't have any exercise equipment at home. So these would be things like planks or push-ups or other exercises like this. So it's, it's really about being a little bit creative and thinking outside the box. Let's change gears for a moment and talk about some of the things that are happening in the field of research in exercise interventions and MS. I'll admit to being a bit of a science junkie. I, I believe that research creates a future. And I know one of your research interests includes predicting the outcomes of exercise intervention using neuroimaging. What can you tell us about your research and how it applies to people with MS? Well, thanks for asking. I'm always happy to talk about my research. Um, we're really interested in this area uh, because people with MS go to rehab multiple times throughout the course of their disease. And regular MRIs are a standard of care for, for people with MS. And so I'm looking to understand how we can leverage those two things. It would be really helpful um, as a physical therapist if MRIs could help me understand what kind of training would be best for my particular client that's sitting in front of me. Um, and who would benefit most from different types of, of aerobic interventions that are available to me as a therapist. Uh, we're still a ways off from knowing the answer to this, but we're working on a few different studies right now looking at this idea. Um, so kind of taking a picture of the person as in their clinical 
uh, side of things. So how fast do they walk? What's their cognition like? What's their balance like? How much do they fall? And then looking at their MRI and trying to understand what type of training would be best for that individual. Your research also focuses on examining the relationship between mobility and cognition. What can you tell us about your findings in that area? Um, sure. So we have looked at the uh, relationship between walking, balance, all sorts of different motor tasks and cognitive function. We want to understand how changes in cognitive function impact a person's ability to learn new motor skills, um, particularly after a relapse, if they are relearning different skills um, and recovering those skills. And so we've published on the relationship between uh, motor function and cognitive function in middle-aged and older adults with MS. Um, and we're also currently working on some studies trying to understand if there are certain domains of cognitive function. So those that are most strongly impacted by MS are things like working memory or information processing speed or executive function and whether those domains are particularly linked with different motor tasks. Um, so that would allow us as physical therapists to sort of um, you know, target two birds with one stone sort of is the saying, you know, if we can work on a really challenging motor test that also requires some cognitive effort, maybe we can also uh, see some benefits in cognitive function as well. Can you share any novel physical therapy interventions for individuals with MS? Well, I can tell you about a study that we just recently published. Um, looking at telephone delivered exercise for people with MS is specifically targeting fatigue. Um, so it was a randomized trial where half of the individuals received regular in-person therapy and half of them received telephone delivered therapy and the therapy included aerobic and resistance training. Um, and both of the groups had improvements in their fatigue and they both rated the exercises as acceptable and they all both had excellent adherence. So this was pretty exciting because telephone delivered therapy allowed us to overcome a bunch of the barriers that we talked about earlier. Um, the question I always get about this is, did the people actually exercise while they were on the phone? And the answer is no. Uh, they just talked with their trainer about what they had done for the week and then got a new prescription for the following week. Um, and so that, that's always the question that I get about this. But it was, um, it was a really exciting study to see that we could overcome a lot of the barriers, especially here in my home state of Michigan. Uh, not everyone lives close to a major medical center where they can come and see an MS specialist. So especially those people who are up in the Upper Peninsula, they're not necessarily close to um, a neurophysical therapist who they can see for fatigue. So that was really exciting. Since you mentioned that you're happy to talk about your research, I'm wondering if there's any additional research from the Neuroimaging and Neurorehabilitation Laboratory that you'd like to share with us. Yes, I'd love to. Um, so we currently have a grant uh, from the National MS Society to look at fatigability. So we've talked a lot about fatigue today, uh, but fatigability is the idea of starting out walking or exercising and then getting a little bit slower over time. So your muscles sort of begin to fatigue as you're walking. And um, so we are, we're looking at fatigability now and trying to develop ambulatory measures, or another way of saying this is that at-home measures of fatigability so that we can understand how prominent this is and that um, we can use it as a way to, uh, to look at people's function at home in their home environment because we understand that what you can do in the clinic isn't always representative of what you can do at home. Um, and so that's one of our studies. And then we also have a really exciting study looking at backward walking as a novel outcome measure for people with MS and backward walking training uh, to improve balance and fall risk. Um, our training study is posted on clinicaltrials.gov. We'd be happy to have you participate if you're near us. And as soon as our lab is permitted to reopen, we'll, we'll be uh, back to work on those studies. Well, you've shared a lot of great information about the importance of exercise and physical activity for people living with MS, and, and maybe equally important, how we can go about overcoming some of the common barriers to incorporating exercise into our daily routine. What are the top three takeaways that you'd like our audience to remember today? 
Um, I think I would say the top three takeaways would be that one minute of exercise is better than zero minutes. Um, so start slow. Don't be hard on yourself if you see that a goal is for 30 minutes, but you can only do five. Um, doing some is better than doing none at all. So I think that's number one. Number two would be to set realistic goals and to track your progress. Um, you can't know if you're improving unless you really keep track of it over time. Um, and then I think the third goal is really to share your exercise goals with your family and friends who can support you and, and work out with you. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Now, let's continue taking more of the questions that our audience has for you. Katie loves to exercise, but says that often her body begins to hurt after about 10 minutes. She's wondering if she should fight through it until she's finished or should she stop when she feels pain? And she also wonders if she continues, will it cause damage or can she even experience a relapse? So I'll first start by saying there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that exercising contributes to MS relapses. It is safe for all people with MS. Um, I do, want to, I do want to say it's pretty important to include a warm up in your exercise routine. So making sure to warm up before you um, really, really start increasing the intensity of your exercise. And that can also help with um, reducing pain. But when you start to see pain after 10 minutes of exercise, the first thing that I start thinking about as a therapist is what's causing the pain? Is it poor form? Um, is it, uh, you know, someone compensating for a weakness in another part of their body and doing something, you know, a little bit funny with their, the way that their body is positioned and that's causing the pain? Um, can we correct it? Uh, if we take a short break and start again, is the pain any better? So I think there's a little bit of a problem solving that has to happen in order to identify uh, what's causing the pain. If it's a true orthopedic injury, um, I wouldn't recommend pushing through it. If it, but if it's related to say fatigue or poor form and taking a short break helps you have the energy to, to do the exercise correctly with better posture, better form, and that takes the pain away, um, then I think that would be the solution. Dave heard you when you said that the recommended amount of exercise he should be doing is 150 minutes a week. And he isn't sure if he can do 30 minutes consecutively, wants to know if it's just as effective to split up the time throughout the day. Um, the short answer is yes. And the long answer is you should try to do at least 10 minutes at a time um, if you're able to. So there is some evidence to support getting your heart rate up for 10 minutes at a time is um, better than just one or two minutes if we can. Um, and then working our way up to, to 30 minutes would be ideal. So if you can do three 10 minute bouts, that would be just as effective as the full 30 minutes. I think that would be fine. Nick uses a wheelchair and he wants to know if using his standing frame is a helpful way to get exercise. So that was one of the things we talked about earlier with regard to a standing program. So absolutely, um, I would say that any kind of standing would be helpful. And Nick would really want to make sure to watch his posture in the standing frame. So if he starts to get really tired and, and really rely on the frame for holding him up, then it's time to take a break because um, he's going to want to try to use his legs as much as possible while he's in the frame um, and just use it for balance. But absolutely, I think standing is a great way to, um, to increase not only balance, but also strength. Cheryl says her left leg is weaker than her right leg, and she was wondering if there are exercises that can strengthen her weaker leg. Absolutely. Um, this is another great opportunity to work with a rehab professional for a tailored program. Um, one of my favorite exercises to recommend is the sit to stand exercise. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, so for Cheryl, I'd recommend placing your left foot back and your right foot slightly forward when you're doing the sit to stand and it will force your left leg to do a little bit more work. Um, this is called a staggered sit to stand and it's a really great strength exercise. You'd want to repeat it uh, 10 times for several sets and it would be a, a good place to start. Tanya is looking for motivation strategies 
especially on those days when her body just doesn't want to move. Uh, Dr. Fritz, any suggestions for Tanya? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, so this is where, you know, having that person who uh, can help motivate you, your friend or your family member who can work out with you is helpful. So in that case, it becomes more like a social thing than uh, as much work. <laughs> um, but again, Tanya should remember that one minute is better than zero minutes. Um, and on the days where she's just really not feeling it, maybe starting out with like some stretching or some light yoga or activities that don't require specific, a lot of exertion uh, might be a better way to ease into to getting her exercise in on those days. But that's a really tough one and I understand that. Paul is wondering how he can best stay active during the winter months when it's too cold or icy to walk outdoors. Yeah, um, I feel you, Paul. This is how it is at my house right now, too. <laughs> um, if you have stairs at your home and you're safe to do so, you can use the stairs as a way to improve uh, your aerobic capacity, so getting your heart rate up. Um, if you don't have stairs but you have a step stool, you can do step ups. So step up on the stool, step back down, up and down. Um, get your heart rate up a little bit with that, get some strengthening in your legs. You can do walking around your house. Um, again, it's often hard to get your heart rate up with those with a short walk like that, but at least you can get some steps in. Um, you can continue to do your strength training, flexibility and neuromotor exercises in home. Um, this is a little tough right now, but generally I would recommend to clients to walk at like a big box store, like a um, a grocery store or a Home Depot or something like this where they're just really big stores and you can kind of walk the perimeter. So if it's very cold outside, you can, you know, do your walk inside. Um, this is sort of like graduating from the mall walkers. If you, people don't go to malls that much anymore, I don't think, but, um, you know, going somewhere where you can walk uh, for longer distances and get your heart rate up. That's a little bit tough right now in the age of COVID, but, um, if, you, if there's a place where you can go to, to walk around a track or something like that, that would be another option. George writes that he's intimidated to go to the gym and take classes because his MS symptoms are invisible. How does someone living with MS find a class or a trainer who understands MS? And George also wants to know how people with MS can find adaptive programming? Sure, good question, George. Um, I think I would start first by reaching out to my local um, national MS support group uh, to, or contacting my state national MS society. Um, you could also use the MS navigator on the national MS website, uh, but the support groups are likely to know who are those um, individuals who teach adapted courses or who are um, the you know ms specialist uh physical therapist in the area and they can they can they can connect those people um, if you're looking for a physical therapist you can go on the apta's website and click find a pt and um, this will allow you to put in your zip code and look for neurologic physical therapists in your area. Um, and these individuals can all help you to find classes or trainers or even adaptive programming that will best suit your needs. Rosanna wants to know if doing yoga, Pilates or stretching is a good workout if it doesn't increase her heart rate that much. So uh, Dr. Fritz, are those things elements of a good workout? what heart rate should someone strive for when they're exercising and what heart rate is considered too high? Okay, so there's a lot of questions there. Um, but I think the first one is that yes, yoga, Pilates and stretching are all important elements of a good exercise routine. Um, these fall under the neuromotor and flexibility categories that we talked about earlier. Um, so they're good components of our exercise routine. As far as heart rate is concerned, this is where we're thinking more about the aerobic side of things. And we're striving for that moderate to vigorous heart rate. Um, so this is 40 to 60% for moderate and then 70 to 80% of heart rate max for the vigorous. And again, we calculate our heart rate max by seeing 
20 minus our age, um, and then taking the percentage of that for, for the different moderate to vigorous. Uh, so we don't really want to go above that uh, if we can. Um, if you start to see that your heart rate is uh, 100% or um, of your heart rate max, you maybe want to you know, slow down just a little bit. Well, Dr. Fritz, thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. Thanks to all of you who submitted your questions as well. I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you. And these are resources that you can really count on to be current and credible. I want to remind you that the National MS Society's MS Navigator team is your best partner when it comes to connecting you to the very best information and resources on living with MS. You can reach an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the Society's website by chat. And please visit the National MS Society's website for resources on lifestyle, physical activity, and exercise including the society's recommendations for exercise and physical activity and videos of exercises that you can do at home. You can also look for the MS Society's videos with tips for exercising and stretching on the society's YouTube channel. These are especially difficult times for so many people and I want to make sure that you're aware that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They offer free and confidential support for people in distress, as well as suicide prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. You can reach them by calling 1-800-273-8255. Every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you'll take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. You'll find the Real Talk MS podcast at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Walk MS 2021 is coming, and this year, Walk MS will meet you where you are to connect, celebrate, and make a difference like never before. You can learn more and register at nationalmssociety.org slash Walk MS. You can connect with the National MS Society along with others affected by MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. I encourage you to like, subscribe, and make sure that you're on the Society's mailing list so you'll continue to receive the latest information on MS and updates on upcoming programs like this one. I'd like to thank Dr. Nora Fritz for joining us today, and I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us for your great questions. Please remember that a recording of this webinar will be available at the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. And I hope you'll join us for next Friday's edition of Ask an MS Expert, when we'll be talking about aging in MS with Dr. Jaime Imatola the Director of the Division of Multiple Sclerosis and Translational Neuroimmunology at UConn Health. Now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to that survey pinned to the comments section. On YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take a minute and please fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Nora Fritz and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices. <music>